I need some traction. You need some traction. Hey everyone, Lloyd Lobo here, co-founder at Boast AI and Traction. Today's Traction webinar is brought to you by Boast AI and Launch Academy. As you're joining, please feel free to introduce yourself to everyone. Click everyone and introduce yourself, what company you're from, what you're looking to get out of the session, where in the world you're tuning in from. Um, we'll take your questions at the end. Super, super exciting topic today on how to raise your seed in Series A in 2022. Our speaker today is an old friend I've known from, I guess, from when I started the company. And um, you know, he's a serial entrepreneur. He's a VC at Panache Ventures, which is raising its fund too. He was a co-founder of iStock Photo, which was acquired by Getty. And one of the OG hypergrowth entrepreneurs, community builders, just a man in general. And that's why we can see here, hundreds of people have registered. Pat, welcome to Traction. How are you? Thank you, Lloyd. Uh, great to see you. <laughs> awesome. Fantastic. Cool. Lots and lots of people joining in here. We'll get right into it. Um, you've had a terrific journey, right? As an entrepreneur, community builder, investor, walk us through your journey. How did you get to where you are today? Yeah, so, so Lloyd, I feel like a couple of things have informed my journey as an entrepreneur. It, it, as with all people, I think it, it starts with a little bit of a personal story. So, um, so I saw my parents really work hard and struggle to get to where, they're, where they were at. Uh, so I was born in Hong Kong. Uh, parents immigrated to Canada when I was five. And I saw them give up these uh, professional jobs and come over to Canada because they didn't have the English skills. Uh, they were working as, you know, as factory workers. Uh, they bought a grocery store and they were running a grocery store. And so I really grew up to seeing what small business looked like and the, and the struggle and the hours. Uh, so that, that was the childhood. Uh, but then I, I went off to university and ended up working for some great, uh, for some great people, uh, just always lucked into some great entrepreneurs uh, and some great mentors. And, uh, you know, eventually I, I started working at Adobe and I was at their uh, content division, which sold uh, clip art and photos and fonts. Uh, we were actually selling them on. This is in the mid 90s. We we're actually selling them on CD ROMs and diskettes, three and a half inch diskettes. So that was way back in the day, but eventually uh, broke out on my own, uh, went back to school, got an MBA and uh, ran into an old uh, colleague who had uh, started up something called iStock Photo. And he was just in the middle of a pivot. We pivoted it from a CD-ROM business to an online business. And, uh, the, you know, the rest is history from there. I, well, I think I will have to say that at that time, we didn't quite understand what we had. So we sold the company for $50 million US to Getty Images. And we didn't realize that we had a billion dollar business on our hand or a multi-billion dollar business on our hand. But we sold a little bit early. So I think going to today, Lloyd, um, for me, I think that I have a little chip on my shoulder, which is I won't ever let a company now sell uh, for a fraction of what they're worth, if I believe they can get to unicorn status. And you and I have talked plenty about making sure that you're squeezing out the full potential of a company before before you let it go too early. Definitely. I think, I, I, but, you know, this was 2006. $50 million is a lot of money in 2006. Here, every day, there's another unicorn. Rounds are $50 million. I'm sure you and the founders did pretty okay. And then you went on to other companies, but uh, you know, the comparison is, is hugely different. Now the, you know, the market is absolutely bonkers right now, right? How should fund founders think about fundraising and valuations in this market? I mean, you're a VC, but you're also been a founder. Yeah, for sure. And so I think a couple of things, Lloyd, I think it's super important to say that money isn't the only measure. I think that I look at it and I say that um, when somebody put, uh, you know, when Getty Images put that $50 million in front of us, I, I think that we were, weren't confident enough in ourselves to believe that we could take it any further. We didn't have the confidence in ourselves that we could build a billion dollar company and more so than the money. I want to help, uh, I want to be part of that community that helps instill that confidence in the founder community and the entrepreneur community that they can build 
uh, billion dollar businesses with that support around them. So I think that's super, super important. Um, secondly, I think that uh, it's, just, it's just super important that you reach outside of your local community, uh, whether it's, uh, whether it's you know, uh, entrepreneurs or whether it's uh, investors. Uh, because you know, all of a sudden you've got a wider market for you to value. And I would say that typically, you know, in, in smaller Canadian cities, you might see a five or seven X uh, multiple on revenues. Uh, but then what you may look at as far as, uh, as far as New York or San Francisco multiples, we're seeing upwards of 150 X annual revs in, in some of our follow on investments. Uh, so there's a massive, massive contrast and you have to be able to tell the story. And I think you have to get in front of enough investors to make that happen. Ah, I, I was on, I was on mute there for a second. And, and so like then every other day, um, right. Companies are raising, when is the right time to raise? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I think that um, it, you know it's time to raise if you think that you can get a little bit of momentum and a little bit of speed. I think this probably goes for uh, goes at all times, but I think especially now when there's a lot of FOMO in there, like you say, there's a lot of money. Uh, it's kind of bonkers, and if you can get a term sheet uh, and you can get enough excitement around your around your investment uh, that uh, you can close within a month or so, uh, then yeah, I think get out and raise. Um, you'll find out pretty quickly when you talk to investors how fast it can close. I think that uh, I've seen companies out there still, if they're not telling the right story, uh, if they don't have all the information together, if they don't have enough attraction to raise what their, uh, what their target amount is, uh, that they struggle and that gets out in the market pretty quickly. Uh, so you want to be able to time it out so that there's enough excitement in the round so that, uh, so that you can get it done. It's a signal for people that they can jump. Uh, if, if it's going fast, uh, they'll, they'll put a little more effort. They'll put you at the top of their pile. Definitely. And then, you know, have the metrics changed significantly? Like you're looking at, you know, pre-seed, seed, A, B, what do you think are the right metrics at these stages in, in this day and age as, as companies are Q4 or Q1 next year planning to raise? So at the top of the scale or at the top of the uh, valuation scale for each of those areas, I think you're starting to see it move quite a bit. So for instance, uh, I think that what we used to see in the Canadian pre-seed uh, realm was that it was a let's say a five or $6 million Canadian uh, pre or post money valuation, somewhere in that area, raising one to two mil, that's gone up drastically. Uh, and we used to see early revenues. We used to see some uh, product market fit at pre-seed previously, not anymore. So I think those rounds have gotten more expensive. And I think pre-seed has gotten more speculative in that, uh, in that the investments are being made on founder track record and on teams and on market and concept rather than on a built product. So we're seeing a lot of that happen as well. Uh, so uh, I think it's a it's a really interesting market is that if you want to invest pre-seed, it's gotten a lot more speculative. Uh, and uh, and so I think that uh, what I would what I would advise for for companies raising out there is just making sure that uh, making sure that you have some metrics to get people super excited because I think founder, uh, what investors are looking for in absence of revenue is that they're looking for other signals. So I've seen companies raise on, uh, raise on early, you know, the typical stuff, early contracts on, on pipeline, sales pipeline. Uh, I've seen other companies that seed uh, raise on not necessarily revenue metrics, but they're raising on metrics such as, um, such as uh, um, a net revenue retention, right? So if they're able to run a, run a land and expand uh, category, uh, uh, program, I've seen companies basically at kind of very, uh, fairly low revenues, but with big NRRs uh, be able to raise big rounds as well. So tell the story if you can't tell the revenue traction story, you've got to be able to tell a other kind of customer or product traction story. Definitely. And then, you know, is there is there specific hard numbers like, you know, let's say B two B space, right? Um, 
with Panache, what 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 is the ideal founder profile or startup profile for you guys? Yeah, so ideally, and this is really in the sweet spot where we really like to be is uh, you know five to ten x revenues. Um, although that that seems like it's just it would just be an absolute bargain in most cases because uh, we're seeing numbers much higher than that. As far as uh, as far as founders go, we really want to see some indication that they're uh, that they're let's say top uh, top decile top uh, top ninety five percent in the world. So, for instance, um, Lloyd, you and I see a ton of businesses. Uh, so, if we see twenty businesses, we, there might be one founder that looks like man, they're just the best, right? and so that would put them in the ninety fifth percentile. I think we'd like to see that kind of founder, whether it's because of hustle, whether it's because of network, whether it's because of who they know or what they figured out in product. And so uh, right now, I think we're, we're relying on a lot of signals that are just indicators that the founder has abilities uh, because in the early stage, it's gotten expensive enough that, uh, that all you have to do is show maybe a couple of those signals to, um, to, to get funding. Definitely. And is there, is there a certain revenue number, like let's say looking at B2B, for example, um, is there a certain revenue number? Like, what do you look for at uh, at a sort of seed level and at an A level? Like, is there a hard revenue growth numbers that you look at or it's arbitrary? I, I think it's all over the map. And so we've in the in our best um, in our best deals, we're seeing, you know, one and a half to three million dollars at seed. Uh, but we're seeing the same kind of metrics raise at a valuations. <laughs> so it's been, uh, it, I think that, yeah, it's quite variable, but ideally for us uh, at seed, we're, we're looking at a million dollars or so annual revenues. A million or so annual revenues at seed and, and seed is, uh, uh, w- which is very interesting because back in the day, seed was, you have an idea and you have some validation, right? Now people are exhibiting more and more traction earlier and earlier, making it uh, competitive. Yeah, and I think there's a couple of things, Lloyd, and you've seen this, is that there's there's many ways to get there. So we've seen companies basically spend a lot of money on marketing and essentially buy that traction. Uh, so I, I think investors have to be careful about that, that it's actually sustainable, uh, uh, sustainable go-to-market plan. Uh, but yeah, you know, I think that as things have gotten more expensive, that uh, that founders are getting pretty smart about about laying out their business intelligence metrics, so really digging in and showing not only revenue traction, but showing that they can scale their marketing programs, uh, scaling that, uh, showing that the product has got traction off of some, uh, you know, off the DAOs or MAOs and other kind of engagement metrics. Definitely Ma- makes sense. And uh, so let's let's dive into the process a little bit. Now it's it's interesting because you're probably coming in uh, from both sides, right? Like you're looking at it from a VC perspective and also a former founder. What what how should founders approach their funding round? Like what should the process look like? You know, planning, prep. Uh, dive into that a little bit. What do you see? Yes. Yeah, and this is a really a tough one, Lloyd. I think that um, as you know, as you've experienced on your end, uh, I think fundraising is um, is a is a long it's a long journey. It's a long term. Uh, you got to have a long term plan for that. So I would say that you know you've uh, in both cases, you guys have done it perfectly. You guys have been in business for a long, long time, and you were never out actively fundraising. But when you decided to raise, um, the offers just flooded in. It's because, you know, while you weren't f- uh, fundraising, you actually were fundraising for five or 10 years, right? And so it's just a, a super long journey to get there, which is to say that, look, when you, uh, you know, if you're doing good work, if you've built some really uh, great relationships, ones that you've, especially the ones where you've built trust, where you've added value to the ecosystem. Uh, so... Uh, so, so I would say that, uh, I would say that's the first thing, build those relationships, talk to people, show value to the investor and entrepreneur community, even before you're raising. And then it just makes the raise that much easier, uh, when you're out there. Um, so, so that, that would be the first thing. Uh, but I would say that, uh, I would say that make sure that you have enough, uh, goodwill and that, that you have enough information in the community. What I often find is that. 
people are out there um, and you just don't know how to, um, you don't know how to communicate what you're, what you're working on or you're too, uh, you're too opaque with your numbers. Uh, and you just wanna build these relationships where you're updating, uh, updating your VCs and it makes it easy for them to dig in uh, when they're, uh, meaning they're fully educated and you've built this relationship of trust by the time you activate them, right? And so, uh, so I would say that that's the first thing uh, to do uh, when you're doing it. And also make sure you have something of substance to show people. Uh, you wanna show that you're progressing the company along the way. So if it's an annual update or a quarterly update, make sure it's uh, your chart is tracking up and to the right. So I think those are a couple of things that I would think about. Definitely. And, and how do you see like the best founders build relationships with VCs before they even sort of need to fundraise? Like, you know, you, you track a lot of companies but not, is, is it a cold email? Like how, how, how does this happen? Yeah, well, uh, here's, here's the um, almost a dirty little secret of, of the VC industry is that, yes, we do accept cold emails. You can find us on LinkedIn. There's a form on our website that you can get a hold of us on. But our percentage of conversion there is so, so low. We, there might be one out of every couple hundred emails that uh, of a company that we would actually screen uh, because I think the companies there are just either too random or too early. Um, but we take almost every intro through a trusted relationship. So for instance, Lloyd, when you intro companies to us, we always take those intros because we know that you're an experienced operator in the space and you know how to screen companies. And, uh, and so Anybody going through Lloyd uh, is always a, a meeting for us. Right? So there's a market difference. So th then you're going from a, point, uh, a 1 percent or a 0.5 percent conversion rate on cold inbounds to almost 100 percent on intro. So you know one is better than the other. It's superior to the other. So the dirty little secret is this: is that every VC likes to get out there. And, and basically say, oh, we'll take cold inbounds. You don't need to be connected. Always write us on email. But that's really more like PR and, and being entrepreneur friendly. I actually think that it's um, selling a little bit of a dream that can never come true. So I basically, I basically say, look, you know, if, if, your, if your deck shines, yeah, we'll get to it eventually on the cold inbound. But if it shines and you know one of our friends, if you know Lloyd, Go through Lloyd. We'll get you a meeting next week uh, for a deal screening meeting. So there's a way to understand this system. There's a way to get 200x better results. And the first one is through intros. Uh, and so that's one of the ways to do it. The second thing to do it is to just be transparent with the numbers. And so don't be shy. Don't ask for NDAs, but share what you absolutely can. Um, show some real numbers because I think that's where you you basically give the indicator that look, um, you know we're not going you know we trust you with the numbers uh, and we're not shy about our numbers we actually want to brag about the numbers and here they are if you want to see them so I, I think those are a couple of things that that I would keep in mind definitely and you know. Um... I think people should start building relationships when you don't need it, right? It's, it's funny, I, I say this story a lot. Um, after we raised in December, we weren't actually raising, we met the investors through our network, the Radiant guys through Traction, they wanted me as a venture partner and, and whatnot to build this good relationship and it came together. Over the summer, we got pulled into this B round, right? Like lots of people just inbound, inbound, a lot of press, of course, Sunicorn list, that list, the other list. And then we found ourselves in this rut for a B with like 21 VCs in the mix. And then we were like, hey, we don't need the money. We just took money. There's cash in the bank. Execs are here for two months. Why are we raising? So we punted, we literally emailed all the VCs on a Friday and say, hey, let, um, we don't want the execs and the team has gone from 30 to 100 people in a few months, feel like they're running with a gun to their head. So we're gonna pause this through next year. Um, and, and so that created this, this sort of, FOMO, but then it also enabled us to continuously build relationships with those growth stage investors, right? Over time, and then you get to know them. It's a, it's a, it's a long marriage, I guess. <laughs> versus yeah, yeah, absolutely, Lloyd. And I saw, I saw a number, or I saw a question coming through on the chat. It basically says, "Hey, how to how to startup founders um, add value to VCs?" and 
I think that's super interesting. You just mentioned a couple of those points, which is, which is one, um, you guys understand the industry, right? So, so I think that you guys have a very rich um, view of a community. And, and so you definitely add value to VC just by either talking about what's happening out there in the ecosystem, or you could probably highlight some of your top companies and make those intros to VCs. And so if you're in the middle of deal flow, Certainly, um, certainly your, uh, your opinion and your view of these startups is super valuable. So I think you, I think, I, I think that, uh, founders can add a lot of value to, um, to, to VCs as well. So I think those are just a couple of the areas that you can help. Definitely. And I think, uh, making good intros, right? So I think it's very important to understand what stage the VC invests in and, and what's a good fit for them. Because if you make blanket intros, you'll just blow your reputation if they're not a good fit, right? Like, oh, uh, a Pat invests in seed companies. Let me just send him every napkin idea. And then the, that's the best way to say, I'm, I'm not going to take Lloyd serious anymore, um, that sort of thing. So I think one of the most important things is understand and make make intros. But it's it's funny because before our B or, or the B that we punted, all these growth stage VCs, I would occasionally make intros for them because we're in that sort of circle, right? And our friends are raising or clients are raising and then you, you make those intros. Let's, let's move into the sort of figuring out the price for oh, this Lord. end deal. Lloyd, I wonder if I could interrupt you on that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on, a, go on, go on, go on. Add, add a flourish on that, which is I think most people that I've met uh, know how to make uh, good intros, meaning, you know, double opt in, make sure yeah. the email contains just yeah. enough information, include the deck, you know, all those kinds of best practices. Uh, but I would encourage uh, everyone, if you don't know how to make a good intro, you don't know best practice for BCCing people, for getting double opt in, all that stuff. Uh, get on the internet, uh, search up, uh, search up how to make a killer intro and do all of that template that. And once you get good at that, you'd be surprised at how quickly your network grows and you should essentially get really, really good. This should be one of your top skill sets is, is, uh, making great intros to VCs and other entrepreneurs. Hundred percent. And you know, for those who don't know what double opt-in is, never make a blind intro to a VC. You know, just reach out and with some high-level metrics of the business. This is why I'm excited about these guys. Here's what they do: growth rate, etc. Would you be interested in an intro? And then make that intro when they approve. If you just make it blind, you're gonna blow your uh, relationship. I actually wanted to show something. I'm gonna quickly screen share because I syndicate with a with a lot of investors. I use a tool called Mixmax. Um, and so if you see here, these are both my portfolio companies. I reached out to 86 investors and about like 30 took intros with them. Um, I mean, all their metrics are public anyway, but this is, this is a kind of, like I send an email like this to 80, 90 investors, and then 20 or so will say, Hey, I'll take the intro. And they appreciate that versus imagine making 80 blind intros. <laughs> well, yeah, and, and Lloyd, not only eighty blind intros, but I mean that you're running a clinic on how to make intros, which is, would you like this intro? And by the way, here are top three points why you should take this intro. Meaning, here's some revenue traction. Here's what I know about the founders, et cetera, et cetera. Imagine getting that email versus, hey, I know this guy. Would you like to talk to him? Right, and, uh, and that is, there's a market difference between a good intro and a bad intro. Definitely, definitely. And you know, what, what's really funny is this year I started angel investing. So when I make those intros, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, writing small checks. I tell the founders, if my network invests in you, then reserve like a small amount for me. And they're happy to do that, right? Because you made the intro, they got a few checks uh, and that's worked really well. So let, let's talk through this process of figuring out the price. This valuations is nuts. Um, and most founders think that they can go and command the 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 X. But how should people think about it? It's market? super tough. Uh, I'm not sure that we figured it out exactly, but you really have to show that you're, uh, you're that you're going to give them a, a top percentile return. And top percentile return means that uh, you're in a big market uh, that there's a potential for a billion dollar exit uh, that you can return not only the so-called magical 10x, but I think you got to be in the 50 to 200x range on the original investment. And the way to think about it is this, can a VC put money into your early stage startup and then by the time you exit or by the time they exit or you all exit, 
that they can return the entire fund. And you know, these funds, for instance, range all the way from our little fund at Panache being $58 million to some funds being hundreds of millions of dollars. For instance, Inovia's latest growth fund is something like $430 million. Uh, that was just announced on, on BetaKit today. So any one investment either in my fund or in Inovia's fund needs to return that entire fund. And right? so that's a thing to look out for. And, uh, and so, you know, do the math on that, understand it, understand how big it is. And I often see uh, people say, well, why wouldn't you invest in my company? You know, I think I can return a solid 3x or 5x. But if you look at the math that it takes uh, to pay and run a VC organization and to pay investors back, three to five X won't do it. So I think that's the first thing is either convince them that you're either growing on your way there, or if you're pre-revenue and even pre-product that you're, you're building enough disruption or you're moving into a category that's big enough where the TAM's big enough to, to address those big return issues. Yeah, definitely. I am seeing some friends of mine with, uh, you know, Eric Sim says uh, NFX is latest. There's a lot of money in the market. And then you have these hedge funds uh, like Tiger and everyone getting into it and they're disrupt. All this means is if you're a good founder, there's lots of options and, and lots of money uh, and, and you can you can sort of raise. But I have friends who have one, two, three million in revenue raising at two, three hundred million valuations. But that's not the case for everyone, right? Like you need to have something, either like a growth rate on free users or like there has to be something that's abnormally spiking, right? Isn't it? Yeah, I, I think you want to show something that's uh, that's a metric that somehow they think that matters, uh, that um, that is well above uh, well above industry standards. So you want to show essentially top percentile indicators of of something. And so, for instance, I mentioned net revenue retention. So, for instance, for every one new dollar coming in if you can produce $2 eventually, then you have a net revenue retention of 200%, uh, as opposed to a lot of companies show revenue churn. And so they'll churn X percentage a month or X percentage a year. And so just to show that, hey, when a dollar comes in on day one, by day uh, 180, that becomes $2 because we have a, we have a great uh, land and expand strategy. And so I think VCs are starting to look at and other investors are starting to look at those metrics because they may predict future growth and future potential of a company. So you don't have to show that metric right away uh, as far as as far as just pure revenues, but show some of that stuff. I think also show that uh, one of the other things is that marketing is really expensive. So we see companies that are, are showing incredible pipeline or incredible efficiency around the go-to-market budget, uh, getting good valuations as well, because man, it's expensive out there uh, to, to buy impressions on AdWords or on Facebook. So if you show that you've got scalable marketing that doesn't depend on paid advertising entirely, I think that's another case for, for asking for a higher valuation. Definitely. And, and, you know, paid advertising, I feel like each year it costs about times and a half more to squeeze the same ROI. So like, you know, what unique channel, what scalable, repeatable channel you have. Uh, yeah. Greg asked here, does Pat only recommend looking for investment from VCs or does he have experience with other things, which jives into, it goes into my next question of your advice for raising from angels. Like when should it be done what is the best way to do it? Um, I mean, there's a time and place for everything, right? Yeah, I feel like uh, if you're raising from angels, you're probably, you should definitely raise from angels and you should do it early um, because I think angels uh, typically are a little more valuation sensitive. I know I was when I was playing in the angel game, which is you're not, you're, as an angel, you're probably not buying into 50, $100 million valuation companies. You're probably buying into sub, let's say sub $10 million. Uh, I think that if you're attracting angels, you're attracting two things. Number one, you're attracting their network uh, and and their advice uh, and not just capital. So if you've got an angel like you, Lloyd, uh, you know, you've got you've got an extensive uh, network of, uh, of investors. Uh, you've got experience. You've got network of operators as well. Uh, getting you in there because uh, uh, because of your experience, I think, is really valuable. What I read into is this, is that if Lloyd has seen 
10,000 startups over the last 10 years. That to me, uh, having him on your cap table is a real signal that uh, this is a serious business as opposed to getting your grandmother to invest in a, you know, your grandmother may, may have done 10,000 deals, but most grandmas haven't. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so not, not to disparage any grandmas out there, but you know, if you have, if you have a family member that doesn't do angel investing, they put, they're putting in uh, 20 grand versus Lloyd putting in 20 grand is, is very different. So I would say definitely get sophisticated angels early onto your cap table. It's a great signal. Definitely. I think uh, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, early days getting like some experienced operators to invest because they not only then invest, they make intros, they, they help you out with strategic advice. And it's a, it's a good positive uh, signal there. Um, there's a lot of founders playing FOMO here, right? Like in, in this day and age, oh, I'm talking to lots of investors, Tiger is in, like, how do you feel about this? Like FOMO tactics from founders and how do you react? Oh man, it, well, number one, it's real. So there are legit billion dollar funds out there writing uh, earlier and earlier stage checks uh, on earlier, earlier met, uh, metrics. So it, it's a very tough environment out there. What I would say is this, is that uh, right now, I think everyone is acknowledging they're overpaying. Uh, and so it's important to understand what people are, are overpaying for. I think they're overpaying for uh, top percentile founders. And so I think you have to give a uh, give the impression or at least have built a track record that you are people of your word, that you're that when you make a promise, you're going to follow through, that you're good at projecting revenues, that you're good at executing. So really show that you're smarter, that you hustle more, that you actually can deliver and execute. So I think that's super, super important. I think the second thing is that, um, is that at least this is something we're doing at Panache and we're seeing a lot of other firms do it, is that if you're overpaying for something, um, is that we have a vested interest in getting you to grow into that valuation. So you're seeing the best VCs uh, pouring efforts, uh, whether it be consulting, whether it be coaching, whether it be mentoring, some kind of program to put companies on track to grow and helping them, uh, you know, coaching them through that period. So we've implemented programs to help our companies grow faster uh, with, uh, with coaching and with, uh, with uh, our impact team and consulting. Definitely. So a, a question, question here around what is the target percentage ownership for the founder typically at seed A, B, what are you seeing out there? Well, I, there's a quick metric on that that you can run, which is I typically say that as a founding team um, at pre-seed and seed, uh, if you give up, um, if you own 100% to start, you give up 25% on the pre-seed, you give up another 25% at seed, by the time you hit the series A, uh, you'll uh, you'll still own more than 50% of the company, right? And so only if you dilute another 25% on the third round would you go below 50% ownership. And so to me, I think that if you were around those areas, if you were 20%, uh, you'd be you'd be obviously better. If you give up 30, uh, you're going to be a little more diluted. But I would say that uh, you should you should try and maintain. Uh, majority ownership amongst uh, amongst the founders uh, at above 50% uh, either into the A or into the B, right? uh, depending on, on how good your traction is and obviously how, how valuations work out. Definitely. I'm going to take some questions here from the Q&A as well. What is, what is the most common method to raise seed, uh, convertible note, safe, or price round? Um, I like seed, uh, at seed and pre-seed to do safe notes because it's just faster. The, the legal bills coming off as safe are about, uh, at least the, uh, you know, 25 or, um, max 25% of what it is to do an equity round. It's just with an equity round, you have to diligence all the shareholder agreements, et cetera, et cetera. And that's a little bit heavier. So, uh, our preference is safe and, um, and, uh, and I think the closer it is to standardize 
template, uh, you know, off the YC site, the better, because it's just less legal fees and less time. Definitely. So a bunch of people asking here, what would be enough traction? I mean, we talked about traction at seed and A, and I think, I think you, you talked about this, like half a million to a million in revenue uh, at seed and then beyond. I mean, what I'm seeing here, at least in the Bay is uh, sort of half a million to a million at seed. I'm seeing A deals getting done at one to 2 million and B deals done getting at, done at like three to 5 million. Yeah, and, and Lloyd, you know the reality of it is that it's incredibly hard to just pick one metric and yeah. say, you know, this is how to get to X valuation because the reality is, is none of those rules apply. Is that is that I can show you cases where uh, companies at three million dollars are are struggling to get their get their seed, uh, and then companies at half a million dollars have oversubscribed A rounds, and and so there's no rhyme or reason to it. I think that if you combine all those measures and look at industry, look at growth curve, look at founder profiles, look at product. A look at the competitive landscape. You have to combine all of that to get a valuation formula. And that's what's kind of frustrating, uh, I think, to founders uh, in general, which is give me a number and I'll hit it. And the reality is uh, there is no algorithm. There is no set number. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's the thing, right? I, all my friends in my circle here are raising and, and often it, it's starting to feel like it's more supply and demand versus metrics which is really, really strange. I have a number of friends raised at very high valuations and it just seems like supply and demand. If they think it's a big market, you have one of the two growth metrics at like maybe a triple, which is either revenue or, or user growth. And you have very, very high NRR, net revenue retention. And for everyone's benefit, it's your revenue minus churn plus upsell, cross-sell. Uh, if you have some fundamental and fundamentals and there's a bunch of FOMO going on there, <laughs> through your network, it's easy. It's easy to raise. And like, I mean, if you look at Dooley, you guys are in Dooley, right? We are eighty yeah. million dollars Series B. Yeah. So they raised a hundred million in seed Series A and B in a span of six months, at a pretty good valuation, right? Yeah, really good valuation. What do you yeah. think was the standout there? Like any any key lessons without like disclosing confidential stuff? Like key lessons from there. I think that, uh, you know, they, they really, really had a great product or still have a great product. And so, uh, even when I, when I, you know, when I saw this company three and a half years ago, I saw Chris and Justin are just fantastic entrepreneurs, really loved the product, uh, that they built, uh, really liked their hustle. So I, I think that's the beginnings of it all. Uh, but as we dug into it, as we worked with Chris and uh, Chris and Justin, what we discovered was that the product was not only beautiful from a product review standpoint, but their customers, they were landing and expanding every customer account. So it had some incredible industry leading uh, net revenue retention numbers. And, and I think that uh, the customers, uh, or investors really saw two things. Number one is that this was a hot space. So there was a lot of money and a lot of revenue expansion opportunities uh, as, a, as a marketplace in general uh, and a real opportunity to be disruptive. And secondly, just incredible, uh, incredible, um, you know, customer traction numbers behind the scenes. Definitely. Um, a bunch of folks are asking on like raise struggles and if I can't raise, should I stop? So, you know, I, I'm, I wanna share from a founder perspective here, uh, being a part of two failures and, and both doing okay, uh, build a company because you believe in the market and you want to deliver value to customers versus, you know, uh, going through the ebbs and flows of just to fundraise. Um, I look at it as dating, right? So your first, first phase is you don't go to a bar and say, I want to marry you. You optimize for the number and then the text. So it's like the first phase is validation. You're trying to validate the market. Maybe you get five, 10 people in the B2B space to pay you to try it out. Next step is product market fit and you're optimizing maybe to get to a million. Um, and the next step is product channel fit where you're trying to figure out one repeatable scalable channel and in, in some format thereof. And then, then you get to a point of scale where you're spending time scaling what you've nailed and small amount of time trying new things to, uh, to nail, right? Um, I think build your business in with the mindset of, hey, what do I need to get to by the end of this year or next year? Like, what do I need the money for versus 
oh, I'm just raising. It, it sounds really cool to raise money right now, which is as silly as it may seem, but a lot of people want to raise for the wrong reasons. Just make sure you're not raising for the wrong reasons. Yeah, and it, just to build on that point, Lloyd, I think it's important to understand that just because a VC thinks that you can be successful doesn't mean you will be successful. You know, VCs get it wrong the majority of the times. It's just that when they get it right, um, they might be able to make a thousand X on your uh, on your investment, meaning that a VC essentially can be wrong 99% of the time. And if they're right once, but, you know, right big time on that once, uh, once out of a thousand, they've more than paid back their fund. And, and so we're talking about investments like original seed investments in Coinbase or Uber or Airbnb. Those are the ones where they re return thousands, if not tens of thousands of uh, X return. And, and so really when you look at it, a VC saying uh, that they love you is basically just, you might give you a one in 100, one in 1000 chance of actually being successful. Uh, and so what you're talking about is, man, if customers want to give you money, that's probably a much better sign than VCs giving you money for your future success. Exactly. Like Speakeasy, we had raised $6 million on an idea. It was incubated by Bessemer Ventures. The company failed because we couldn't get uh, retention, right? The product was, was broken and, and we ran out of that money. The other thing is, I guess, more money, more problems in the sense that when you have money, you can't stop spending it. And this is advice you gave me, I think, uh, um, eight, nine months ago when we were speaking, you're like, <laughs> make, make sure people are aligned with not spending all that money, right? I mean, you had an example for from Fotolia days when you guys raised, what, what was that? Maybe you can, if you're open to sharing that. Yeah, for sure. Well, you know, for most companies, I, I can just talk about this a little more generally, but when VCs give you money, uh, they, the whole interest clock starts to tick. And so think about this, the VC money, just like any other money is not free money. People want a rate of return. So people that invest in VC funds are expecting better than, you know, their typical average investment returns. So what are the investment returns out there? Like right now, if you stick the money in the bank, you're probably getting less than 1% interest. Uh, if you're in in a bond, uh, it might pay, I don't know, depending on the on the bond type, five to let's say eight percent on a corporate bond. Um, you know, Apple bonds probably pay, I think, you know, in the single digit percentages, so it's low. And then something a little more risky uh, might pay 15 or 20 percent. Those are mes debt funds, and then go on and on and on. Well, what do you expect out of a uh, what do you expect out of a venture fund? I think venture funds uh, are uh, these days expecting anywhere between let's say 20 to 40 percent annual returns. And what it means is that for every investment that a VC fund makes, they're expecting you to double or triple in valuation every 18 months, 18 to 24 months. And so. Let's say if somebody gave you a $10 million valuation today and they give you $3 million, they're expecting you to use that $3 million to essentially triple your valuation within the next two years. Uh, and that's a lot of pressure. And so if you were raising that money and just go, no, I'm going to go slow, I'm going to be conservative, um, your VC is not going to be happy with you. Right? They really want you to take that money and grow this company fast. So. Yeah, really make stuff happen. And not only that, but uh, there's something called the T2D3, which is a triple, triple, double, double, double. That should be your growth plan over five years if you're going to start on the venture path. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's a lot of folks now in the growth equity space or different types of venture investors that are fine with like, you know, 50, 100 percent growth. Whatever you do, just make sure you're picking the right investor for yourself, because if you go and say that, um, you know, I want to raise money and like a marketer is not, every marketer is not the same. There's like SEO and there's digital media and there, there's email. The same thing, every VC, no two VCs are the same, right? You got to figure out you're, you're subscribing to their ethos. Um, and so if somebody wants to return the whole fund, like a triple, triple, double, 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 like Pat said, but the others may just invest in like 50 to hundred percent growth. So just make sure you're subscribing to the right thing. Humera asks here, how do you define pre-seed versus seed? It's incredibly confusing. We hear both for our company. Yeah, way, way too confusing. Hi, Humera. How are you? Um, 
Yeah, you know, I don't know that there's a real definition. I would say that a Canadian pre-seed is sitting around, let's say, uh, anywhere, I would just peg a number, six, seven million dollar, under six or seven million dollar uh, pre-money or post-money valuation, raising, let's say, a million or two. Uh, and then um, that that might be just a friends and family round. So a, Cana a, a U.S. pre-seed might be as high as a, let's say, a 10 or $15 million U.S. valuation. So more than double that. So uh, a, um, a, a U.S. pre-seed is probably a Canadian uh, seed. Right. A U.S. Uh, seed is probably a Canadian A, so along those kinds of lines. And so I would say that uh, don't worry about whether it's a pre-seed or seed. Uh, really focus on uh, what size check you, uh, you think you can justify or what size round you think you can justify at using a 25% uh, dilution. So Typically, I look at companies and say and say that uh, if you're trying to raise two million dollars, um, you know, would you uh, do you think you, that you can get justify a six million dollar pre money valuation, meaning that at an eight post, your investors get 25 percent of the company. Can you justify that? Yeah, a any valuation you get, you got to grow into it. But these days, it seems like people are forever raising, forever raising and uh, it may need to catch up at some point. Um, the question here about how do you estimate your pre-revenue valuation? There's a lot of questions here on valuation. I might have to do a whole session on this in, in, in a few months or weeks. Yeah. So you, um, this is really interesting. Though. I think that unlike uh, most things where there's price transparency, uh, meaning that uh, if you're buying or selling a house or buying or selling a car, you get to ask for, you know, yeah, I get to have an asking price for your house or car because there's so much transparency in pricing. You know what your car year and model and mileage is. You get to estimate that against previous, the previous 10 or 20 transactions and you get to come up with a price. Uh, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately in, in the venture world, because there's no direct comparables, it's really hard to compare pricing. And so I, I think about it in, um, uh, basically uh, in one of two ways. Number one is you can run the math, you can run some comparable metrics, uh, you can try and get a, a metric around or estimate a valuation. And to me, I would only use it as a, as a, as a uh, estimate because that's not what you're gonna get. You don't get asking prices in, uh, in, in this uh, startup funding game. Um, but you get offered a price. And so that is to say that companies are never sold, they're bought. Right? Yeah. So you, you need a buyer to make the first bid. And so I think the biggest mistake that most companies make is that they spend a lot of time justifying evaluation and going out and pricing the round and asking VCs to, to, just, uh, to basically buy in on that price. And the reality is, is what you should do is basically say, we need X amount of dollars. Determine whether you need 1 million or 3 million over the next 18 months and see if you can justify that uh, and see what kind of offer comes through, right? And so, for instance, if you if you need $2 million, somebody may decide, oh, this is a really great company. I'll take 10% of the company for that, right? And then all of a sudden, you've got a $20 million pre or somebody may say, you know what? You're so early, I would want a third of the company for that. And so then all of a sudden, then your, your pre money is at $4 million, right? So uh, I wouldn't concentrate so much on the math. I would concentrate on the comparative valuation that a VC is willing to offer you. Yeah, definitely. And, and would you say like all the companies in an accelerator, for example, um, the valuation that they get, is that a good comparative for a pre-seed? Well, I think that uh, ultimately um, you would want multiple people at the table. Like the more people that are willing to buy in at that valuation, the more solid, uh, hopefully the more solid it is. Although these days it's hard to tell, but I think that multiple people at the table at an oversubscribed round says that, uh, says that it's probably priced exactly where the market wants it to be priced. Uh, and, and so the more sophisticated investor and the bigger the checks are, the more validated that, uh, 
um, that uh, that valuation is. But yeah, it, it's really tough. The signals are all mixed up these days. Yeah, definitely. And we'll we'll do a whole session on valuation and and signaling in the next few weeks. Um, the other thing I'd like to share, just from my experience, is uh, you optimize for the relationship. If you over-index on the valuation and you treat people like a transaction, the first time or second time a major roadblock hits, either they're out of there or you're out of there, right? Folks asking here also, how important is it to get a branded uh, VC in the Series A? Um, if they're a branded VC and you're sort of mid-range for them, like for, I, guess, I guess marry somebody who loves you more than you love them. It's not a bad, <laughs> it's not a bad strategy. <laughs> what do it you is. think of that? Yeah, it is. I, I like that strategy. Um, it, it seems like uh, it, it seems like really we're talking about, um, you know, we're reminded by the phrase that your your VC relationship might be more important than your marriage. Um, yeah. You'll certainly you might spend more time at work than you do at home, which is unfortunately the life of most entrepreneurs. Uh, but I, I think I think the real key is this, is that uh, the branded VCs are important because of the signaling that it gives. Uh, you know, the it's much tougher to get into Harvard than it is to get into, you know, a local community college. And I think that the same thing applies to that. Much harder to get a investment from Sequoia than it is from, let's say, a, a you know local angel group. Not saying anything bad about local angel groups is that ultimately the the rigor around due diligence and investment track records those ultimately matter and people read signal off of that definitely definitely now let's let's dive into we have a few minutes here let's dive into investor communication like between sort of through the fundraise process what have you seen uh, typically what are some best practices there like you've had one call you've done the pitch um, how how do the best founders manage that all the way through a term sheet yeah, of- so uh, so a couple of things. Uh, one thing that I've seen really consistently out of uh, out of one group of founders coming from from a certain program is they're able to get the pitch nailed down. They're able to speak uh, to their ideas and to the vision with conciseness, and that would be um, that would be most YC graduate companies in that uh, we schedule 25 minute meetings with our founders. And I find that at the top of that scale are YC founders because after 15 minutes there, they answer all of our questions because their answers are so sharp and so concise that they can take what a typical founder does in five minutes and give us a 30 second response and have that be a richer response. So I would say that, I would say that if you're, if you're pitch ready, you can pitch your company in 15 or 20 minutes, right? Along, you know, complete with Q and A. And that would be a real signal around how to sharpen up that process. Uh, But just show that you're pitch ready. Uh, And then, and then I think a couple other things around this is just make sure that you're that you're asking all the right questions around the fundraise. So get a VC friend, start reading VC books. Uh, so for instance, read Venture Deals by Brad Feld, read, uh, read The Secrets of Silicon Valley uh, or Sand Hill Road. Uh, we have a VC 101 presentation that uh, I, we can post the link for Lloyd that shows, uh, that shows what a VC wants. And so once you understand what a VC wants, I think you can tune your pitch there and really get them exactly what they need to know, get it done quickly. And then you can start to ask the right questions, which is, hey, what's your decision-making process like? What are the things that you need to see from us? What can we follow up with? Uh, you know, are there, uh, what are the metrics that you're looking at? Um, you know, what are the decision points? Who are the decision-making process? You know, how do you go through the investment memo or the research process, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so the closer you can understand their timelines, the better. Definitely. And, and uh, you know, one other tip I'll tell people is it's like sales. Everything is sales. When you meet a prospect, an enterprise prospect or whoever, after the call, you send them a thank you note and summarize the conversation. Do that. Like just, just communication is huge and, and remind them of why of some key moments in the conversation that you enjoyed and, and summarize it and send them the items you promised. Um, yeah. And, yeah. And Lloyd, I think what's really important, I love what you showed on your, uh, on your email intros is that fundraising is just like a sales process. It's not random, right? You've sent out, 
you know, 80 or 100 emails, you're tracking the returns in a CRM, uh, you're tracking all the responses. So what I've seen best practices, even if it is a no, it's not just a no, no, thank you. In most cases, it's a no, because we want to see this metric. And so once you gather up and, and, and uh, start cataloging, up, uh, cataloging that information, then all of a sudden, you know, oh, you know, the, there were 30 VCs that said no, and they gave us a reason. So we better go sharpen that up. But 10 said yes. And so here's the reason why they said yes. And here's what went well in that meeting. Both are very rich sources of information. Definitely. And, and you have to manage. So I'm, I'm also an investor in Mixmax and I use Mixmax. So this is a short plug and also the model on their website. <laughs> but uh, um, no, this, is, this has been a great conversation. Um, I want to ask you, though, as a founder, what's the most valuable thing a VC has done for you and what's the worst thing as a founder? <laughs> I think that as a founder, I really love it when uh, when VCs come in and uh, and basically do more than just ask about numbers. They ask about what we're doing um, as far as how we're doing as far as our mental state goes. Because, you know, to me, especially at small companies, the mental performance, uh, the performance of the, uh, of the company tracks directly to the physical and mental state of the founder or the founding teams. Uh, and so if, if a company, uh, if a founder isn't doing well, then the company typically isn't doing well. And this is so, so important, right? So I think, I think yeah, that, to me, that's one of the real keys here is that we really make sure that the, um, that the mental state uh, and the attitude of the founders is just tuned perfectly for optimal performance and that they go in, they're, uh, they're showing great leadership, uh, and, and really motivating the hell out of their teams. Definitely. And folks, uh, if you want to learn on future sessions, uh, we, could, we could find good speakers on valuations and uh, fundraising pitch decks maybe. Just, just type uh, whatever you want to uh, learn about and we'll go and find the, the speakers. This has been a fantastic uh, session, Pat. One piece of unconventional advice that founders don't utilize enough. Um, I would say that, uh, that people don't focus enough on trust, right? And, and so just think about this, is that everything that comes out of your mouth, everything that you do uh, say or do is about trust. And I didn't realize this um, early in my career is that every interaction, even non, even that's not direct, with an investor, I might be dealing with an investor's friend or their network. Is that, is that your, um, your, most of your sophisticated investors will go out and do a community reference check and they'll say, Hey, how's this Pat guy? Is he, you know, is he what he uh, says he is? Have you ever worked with him? Et cetera, et cetera. Right. And so you've got to start on these relationships early. Uh, you've got to be adding more into the community then you're taking out and make sure that people in the community know your work and people in the community trust you and that they're saying good things about you and that you're doing things without that are that you're doing a lot of things that are non-transactional that you're not always just doing things just because you want something and if you build that reputation you're just going to find it so much easier that when you give more than you take that when you're ready to uh, ask for a take uh, that it's just so much easier when you come back to it. But that I think is, think about um, raising money, you know, five years ahead when you need it right? and build that goodwill five years ahead before you need it. Definitely, definitely. Awesome, this has been fantastic. Um, looking back on your career, what is the one thing you wish you did less of and one thing you did more of? <laughs> I would say that, uh, so Lloyd, you and I, I think and most kind of scrappy entrepreneurs like us um, have had a lot of failures. Uh, and I think that I would forgive myself for all the failures that I had. I think that um, there's always a fear of failure. Uh, and I certainly have that, uh, had that and still have it. Uh, but I, I have a little less of it these days. But I think that uh, I don't look at failure right now as uh, as something that that will kill us. I think that 
the true test of character is that when you fail, how fast can you get up? How, how fast can you brush yourself off and, uh, and do it all over again and do it with the right attitude? So, uh, so to me, I, I think that if I could tell myself, if I could go back 20, 30 years and tell myself something, it's just like, you're going to fail. Don't worry about it, but make sure you jump up, get back fast because nobody can keep you down. Uh, and I think the only person keeping you down is yourself in those failures. I certainly have done a fair share of that, but knowing that I can recover has been, um, has been, has been really my key to success. Chumba Wamba. I like that comment, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a fantastic comment and also in line with rock, what rocky balboa says i think in rocky four or five it ain't about how hard you hit it's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward thank you so much pat great session we're going to do this again we'd love to have, keep having you back this is amazing love and peace thanks right everyone for thank joining you, us Lord. see you